I'm Robert Wright, a visiting professor of science and religion here at uh, Union Theological Seminary. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Um, and also, I want to thank the John Templeton Foundation for supporting the series of conversations um, that uh, tonight's dialogue is part of. Uh, the name of this uh, series of conversations is Contentions. And one reason for that is that we contend with big issues. Um, and I have to say, I'm not aware of uh, any political scientist who is more accustomed to contending with big issues um, than our, our guest tonight, Francis Fukuyama. Um, he's a, uh, 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 he teaches political science at Stanford, is known for writing very big books. Um, I mean big in a figurative sense, but also sometimes they are literally big. So <laughs> to give you uh, an example from his, uh, his recent output, uh, so four years ago in 2011, he published a book over 500 pages called The Origins of Political Order from Pre-Human Times to the French Revolution. And then uh, three years later, uh, last year, he followed that with a sequel of over 600 pages called Political Order and Political Decay from the Industrial Revolution to the Globalization of Democracy. So all told, that goes from pre-human times to globalization. So I, I guess you can be excused for taking 1,100 pages to, uh, to cover that ground. Um, Frank's written a lot of books, uh, many of them uh, comparable in ambition to those, a number of them bestsellers. I guess the book of his that is at least most obviously relevant to what we're going to talk about tonight is probably his first book, a very famous book, um, The End of History and the Last Man, which was uh, based on an essay he had written called The End of History. I think the essay came out in... Uh, in 1989. Um, Frank posited in, 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 in the end of history argument that there was a kind of direction to history and that it was in some sense a positive direction. Um, and one thing we're going to ask tonight is whether it's possible to maintain a very positive view of the future um, in light of some trends and developments these days that many people find troubling, both, both domestically and um, abroad, uh, some people find them so troubling that they're talking in more or less apocalyptic terms. Um, and actually, I think that somewhat apocalyptic scenarios are uh, plausible. And uh, tonight, I hope to get a chance to run, run some of those by Frank and hope that he can talk me out of them and, and cheer me up. Um, the, uh, it turns out I'm not the only person who's interested in, in connecting Frank's end of history argument to kind of recent uh, troubling developments. Um, I don't know if you saw in, in The Atlantic yesterday, did you see the piece by Peter Beiner mentioning you? No. Okay, well then I will do you the favor of quoting from it. So Peter Beiner was writing, uh, it was a piece about the big uh, speech on terrorism that President Obama gave on Sunday night. And uh, the piece includes this paragraph. Obama is a kind of Fukuyamian. <laughs> Like Francis Fukuyama, the author of the famed 1989 essay, The End of History, he believes that powerful structural forces will lead liberal democracies to triumph over their foes, so long as these democracies don't do stupid things like persecuting Muslims at home or invading Muslim lands abroad. His Republican opponents, by contrast, believe that powerful and sinister enemies are overwhelming America, either overseas or um, domestically. Now, I don't, I don't want you to respond to that right now. I want to I wanna leave dangling in the air the question of whether you consider Obama a Fukuyamian, uh, and for that matter, whether you are an Obaman. Um, but before we get to that, um, I just want to try to get a little clear on the, on the end of history thesis. So here's the way I remember it. Uh, in 1989, I was in Washington, as you were. Um, it was an amazing time. The Berlin Wall had fallen. It seemed like, you know, we had won the Cold War. People were saying, whoa, this is amazing. This decades-long struggle with the Soviet Union, and we won. And as I understood your essay, you kind of said, well, actually, you can view this as, as, as uh, victory in a much longer struggle, centuries, not decades. And, and it's a struggle among ideas about how people should be governed. And the winner is uh, liberal democracy. Um, and the essay became a book, and the rest, as they say, is the end of history. <laughs> um, so I want to give you a chance before we go further to, to uh, correct me if I've said anything that's not true, expand uh, if you want on your thesis, and also make sure and tell us what exactly you mean by liberal democracy in the process. Uh, sure. 
Uh, by the way, I should tell you that Bob Wright is the reason that my first volume that he mentioned begins with pre-human times, because until I read his book, The Moral Animal, uh, about evolutionary psychology, which draws heavily on not just you know, the behavior of you know, so-called primitive peoples, but also continuities between primate behavior and human behavior. I had no idea about that stuff. Uh, and so you're important, very important in uh, that aspect of my, my own intellectual development. So the end of history uh, is, is really a story about modernization, or as we put it these days, development, right? Um, I used to run the International Development Program at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, and my students would go to poor countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and try to help these countries uh, develop. And you know, basically what that means is uh, a multi-dimensional transformation of societies, uh, which is what Europe and North America went through initially, what China, Singapore, you know, South Korea have gone through in the 20th century, and what a lot of very poor countries hope to do uh, today, which is to have much higher living standards, make use of uh, science and technology to prevent their kids from dying before they're five years old, uh, and then in the political sphere to have a society in which uh, a kind of open uh, and equal opportunity is available to all citizens, and the economic and the political parts go together because I think that it's very hard to have a very high level of economic prosperity if people are not given uh, you know, the freedom to take opportunities and make opportunities uh, for themselves. So this is a question that has been debated endlessly by social theorists, the most famous of all of them that believed in this idea of history. So what he would have called history what today we call development or modernization was Karl Marx. Marx said, yes, there is such a thing as history. It begins with primitive you know, agrarian societies. Then you go through feudalism and capitalism. And then he said the end of history is communism, where you abolish private property and you know, so on and so forth. Uh, and all I did in 1989 was to observe, it looks like we're not going to get there. That I agree with the Marxists that there is this thing called history, development, modernization, but where it seemed to be terminating was not in communism, which seemed to me a manifest uh, failure as an economic and a political system, but in some combination of liberal democracy and um, uh, a market economy. Uh, and I still basically you know, believe that. I, I think that uh, the question then becomes, is there an alternative? You know, so there are many countries that are not there yet, uh, maybe some countries will never get there, uh, but I don't think that you can have you know, the full panoply of things we associate with uh, modernization or modern life unless you have a certain form of political regime, uh, meaning uh, one that, and so the definition of liberal democracy would be one in which uh, there's an equal balance between three things. You have to have a state, uh, that can actually provide order and services and public goods and the like. Uh, the state has to be constrained by a rule of law uh, that makes sure that rulers don't just arbitrarily make up the rules in their own self-interest as they go along. And then the state has to uh, obey the wishes of as large a portion of the population as possible rather than serving their own narrow uh, self-interest. And that, I think, is the modern uh, formula and I don't really see an alternative out there that's going to get us to you know, what we associate with modernity uh, other than a liberal democracy. The, I mean, we can talk about this. The only real challenger at the moment, I think, is, uh, you know, is China uh, because it's an authoritarian state that has done extremely well in terms of economic development. But you know, how stable that is, uh, whether that regime can continue uh, over the next generation or two in its current form, I, you know, I have my doubts about. So that's basically, that's basically the theory. I think where people misinterpreted me was they, they thought that I was one of these old, old, old type Marxists that thought that there was this inevitable historical process that would lead everybody there, you know, everywhere and always. And I never, you know, I never believed that. I have a much 
you know, mushier uh, version of that, which um, uh, is that, you know, people will get there because of the competition between systems, and in the long run, this system is going to turn out to be more durable. But that, you know, that's a debatable point, especially these days. Yeah, um, it is. And uh, I guess uh, one way, and, and, and you got a certain amount of blowback during the, I guess, 90s when bad things happened around the world, Bosnia yeah. and so on, and, and people said, um, you know, see you're wrong, this isn't utopia, history hasn't ended. And uh, first of all, I sympathize with you because, you know, I wrote a book positing a kind of direction to history, non-zero, and in fact, you generously reviewed it for the Wilson Quarterly, I think. Um, and people took it as being pretty optimistic, and like after 9-11 stuff, they said, see, you were, you were wrong. And when people say, your book is wrong, uh, you have two choices. You can either say, you're right, I was wrong, or you can say you misinterpreted it. Uh, I prefer the latter, uh, and always have. Uh, now, Frank, in principle, may be different because he's actually known for revisiting ideas he's held. Uh, Frank was at one point identified with neoconservatives, quite rightly, I think, but, but then kind of uh, famously broke with them. Uh, in light of uh, the accumulation of evidence um, after, uh, after the Iraq War. So maybe you're willing to say something other than that your critics got it wrong. Is there, is there anything about your argument that you would rethink in light of things going on now? Yes, well, see, that's why you have to buy my last two volumes, because that contains the revision of the original thesis. I shouldn't have told them how long they are, yeah. probably. Uh, <laughs> but they're well worth, well worth the reading. Uh, so, yes, I would say uh, several things. Uh, the first uh, is that uh, after spending all this time, you know, reading history and thinking about this issue, uh, I have realized that getting to liberal democracy, or actually I have this phrase, getting to Denmark, uh, where Denmark is actually not the, necessarily the country Denmark, which is a very nice place, but it's more this symbolic uh, end point of history, which is democratic, prosperous, stable, uh, and has vanishingly low levels of corruption. Uh, and the argument, you know, that I make uh, in the last two volumes is that Denmark got to be Denmark through a whole bunch of historical accidents that probably cannot be replicated in Somalia, Haiti, Nigeria, you know, any number of other uh, countries. Uh, and in general, the historical process is not this machine, you know, and again, that, I think from Marxism, you, you get this view of, you know, historical development, that there are these powerful forces that, you know, compel every country to develop along a certain path, whereas I think that the reality is that a lot of the countries that fortunately end up like Denmark, you know, we're lucky, uh, mm -hmm. and not every country will be like that. The second uh, thing that I think as Americans is particularly important is the whole theme of political decay which is the last part of the second volume, uh, because what I argue is that a modern state is not a natural uh, construct. Mm -hmm. uh, our natural sociability inclines us to favor family and friends, basically. And the modern state requires that we don't do that. It, it's supposed to be impersonal. So you're supposed to pick the most qualified you know, a person for a job and not your cousin or you know, your old roommate from college uh, or whatever. And therefore, I think the Denmark-like final state is always under attack. Uh, it's always trying to be reappropriated by people. And I think that's kind of what's happened in the United States, in American democracy, that with the rise of very powerful, well-funded interest groups, uh, uh, you have a lot of money and power operating in American politics in a way that's kind of reappropriated you know, a state that's supposed to be able to serve impersonally the whole American population and instead you know, serves much narrower interests. Uh, this is not just a fault of democracy. I mean, I think any political system is liable to this, but it means that this story about you know, a progressive history gets punctuated by big regressions, and I don't think there's any necessary reason to think that the regressions are always going to be overcome and the system is going to get fixed. Okay. Uh Another possible regression, I'd say, is, is uh, symbolized by Donald Trump. Um, 
he, you know, and I, and I mean it, I mean, I, I suppose everyone's heard of his latest proposal from, from yesterday to immediately bar uh, entry to the United States, to immediately bar all Muslims from, from entering the United States. Um, and he said a number of things, you know, keep a database on all Muslims and so on. And this may have, I don't know, particular resonance for you. I have read, I've never discussed this with you, I've read that your grandfather was actually put in an internment camp uh, for Japanese Americans during World War II, which just goes to show you that uh, you know, bad things can happen when people are scared. Um, and the prospect this raises, um, you know, is that a liberal democracy, by which I think you mean, among other things, a democracy that respects civil liberties and civil rights, um, can choose through democratic means to become what's been called an illiberal democracy. Um, and I think with a sufficient amount of fear um, instilled in the populace, uh, I mean, I've personally been kind of shocked by the, uh, what Republicans have been saying during the presidential campaign and the positive feedback they've, they've gotten, not only Trump. And when you look at the relatively modest grounds for fear at this point, mm -hmm. right, in terms of actual numbers killed in terrorist incidents, um, I think it's kind of scary to think what could happen if, if things got much worse. So I'm wondering how real you think the possibility is of sliding into a democracy that is something other than liberal? I think that it depends on the country, so I think the danger of that is actually higher in Europe and particularly in countries like the Netherlands and France that actually have very large Muslim minority populations uh, because they've not done a good job in assimilating them and in the long run I just see nothing but political and social conflict over that. In the United States, you know, I guess I'm more optimistic because, you know, the Republicans, you know, at most are like 35% of the whole electorate and Donald Trump gets, you know, 30% of that 30%. And so the actual number of, and then even that 30% of the 30% haven't really thought about it all that carefully, you know, uh, as presumably yeah. they will when you get closer to the election. Uh, so I actually think that the American people have better sense uh, you know, that they like to blow off steam, you know, by telling a pollster that they'd vote for some outrageous candidate. But, you know, when, you know, when you get through this interminable campaign season, they, you know, they end up making more sensible choices. But you're right. I mean, I think, I mean, I absolutely think that we overestimate how dangerous terrorism is in the scheme of things. Uh, I think in the long run, China is a much bigger rival and challenge for the United States than you know, these radical uh, Islamists and that the big, big danger is always in our overreaction uh, to them. One of them was invading Iraq, you know, after September 11th. And, you know, you can just imagine if they actually get their hands on a nuclear weapon or a biological weapon and serious numbers of people get killed, then I think all bets are off. I mean, then I think you could really imagine the United States becoming a, you know, something other than a liberal society. Right, and I mean this, you're kind of getting toward my apocalyptic scenario, which is just that the, you're right, we, we, we have overreacted in the past to the, the, the threat of terrorism. It seems to me we have a habit over, of overreacting. That, the definition is of overreaction in this context is that it makes the problem worse. It increases the number of Muslims who sympathize with ISIS or Al-Qaeda or, or whatever and makes homegrown terrorism more likely and so on. And then if you overreact to that, and I've got to say all signs are to me after San Bernardino that overreaction remains a real possibility, um, then you can imagine it, uh, it just, you know, the, the, the so-called clash of civilizations becoming kind of self-fulfilling uh, prophecy or at any rate the, the, the whole turmoil lasting long enough for someone to get their hands on uh, nuclear weapons, a weapon of mass destruction or so on. I guess what worries me is that it's a positive feedback system, not positive in the sense of good, but in the sense that the two forces reinforce it, they're bad forces that reinforce each other, kind of, you know, fear on our side, hatred on theirs, and, and, and so on. Do you, you, you're less worried, it sounds like. Well, you know, I, I think that the, you can imagine events that really would trigger a really bad overreaction. Uh, but like I said, you know, after September 11th, we made a lot of mistakes, but I think we eventually corrected for them. 
Uh, and I think that, you know, in time, uh, we, we could probably correct for, you know, mm. the ones that, uh, you know, we've made up till now. But, you know, even with ISIS, like, I guess it was 14 or 15 months ago that Obama didn't say I'm declaring war on them, but gave this big speech about how we were, you know, we were going to use military forces. It was a serious threat. It was almost a de facto declaration of, of war, at least in the sense that his political fortunes were now tied to ISIS being at least gradually vanquished. Um, and the, the explicit, a lot of the explicit rationale for this was, um, okay, so, uh, you know, if we don't get rid of ISIS, people can go to ISIS, would-be terrorists, receive training, come back here, and, um, and do bad things in America. Um, and I uh, actually wrote a piece at the time. I, I didn't really take a position on what we should do about ISIS. I mean, it's a non-trivial threat. And then separate from that, there's the humanitarian argument. So it's a complicated issue. But, but what I said was, wait a second. Actually, so far, actual terrorist events um, in the United States done in the name of jihad have not been people uh, that have succeeded have not been people who went and trained in some, in some piece of territory controlled by Al-Qaeda or ISIS. It's been people like the Tsarnaev brothers or Major Hassan, people who were already over here who were uh, inspired um, by, by jihadist uh, doctrine. And, and, and of course the jihadist propaganda depends very heavily on this theme that the U.S. is at war uh, with Islam. So I just said maybe before we basically declare war on something called the Islamic State, rightly or wrongly, we should at least consider this effect, the possibility of, 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 of this exacerbating homegrown terrorism. I would now say San Bernardino is at a minimum not flagrantly at odds with the argument I was making. We don't know that much about it. And so far as I know, no one brought that up. It was not part of the conversation. And that was, that was all I was saying. Can we at least talk about this. So it just seems to me we were going back to this reflex that was manifest in the Iraq war, which is if there's terrorism, there must be a, a nation state that it's ultimately emanating from, and we, we have to go deal with that. And so I'm just saying, I mean, maybe that's a little thing, but it's, it seems to me we're really not uh, dealing very rationally and level-headedly with this thing, even now, long after Iraq. Sorry, that's a long question. It's actually not even a question. I didn't actually, I, yeah, I didn't hear the question in <laughs> okay, there. Okay, so put a question mark at the end of, do you agree? <laughs> um, we can move on. I, yeah, I take no, his silence no, as no. a sent. Well, yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I actually just don't think it's an important, I mean, in the long run, I actually don't think that, as I said, I think the, in terms of the larger historical question, uh, this long run ch uh, competition with China is going to be much more consequential than anything that goes on in the Middle East. I mean, why is it that ISIS attacks people in cafes or in, you know, uh, centers for disabled people? I mean, it's because they're we basically, overreact. yeah, I mean, well, not just that, but it's not a powerful organization. I mean, they're just disgruntled individuals. In the modern world, they can kill, you know, a couple, you know, a few dozen people, uh, you know, in small groups, but in the end, that's not a big deal. China in 10, 15 years is going to have a bigger economy than the United States, and it's going to have a very, very different political system. It's going to be able to reshape the entire global order, uh, and they're much smarter than these ISIS people. You know, they're patient. Uh, they have objectives that are not our objectives, but uh, you know, they're not so flagrant in in shoving this stuff in your face that they provoke this immediate uh, uh, reaction and. Uh, it is not a democratic political system. I mean, it's a very deep challenge, I think, uh, to our way of life, uh, you know, because ISIS, I mean, <laughs> in the Middle East, people do not want to live under this kind of, you know, terrorist regime. They, they hate it. I mean, the vast majority of people in Muslim countries do not want to live under this form of government. Whereas China, you know, in a certain sense has become a model for not just, a, you know, 1.3 billion Chinese, but a lot of other people in the world who say, yeah, I'd like to have, you know, semiconductors and, you know, global exports and an authoritarian political system. Mm -hmm. So that's the sense in which I think you're focusing on the wrong thing if you think that ISIS is going to be, you know, the death of Western civilization, because I, I, you yeah. know, I really think that we can handle that one. 
course, the good news is China, A, doesn't want to establish a global caliphate. B, uh, I think, doesn't define its relations to us in nearly such zero-sum terms more broadly as, as ISIS does. I mean, it, it's certainly not a democracy. That's not the same as saying it can't coexist with us um, in principle. I, I mean, um, I guess oddly, one of the things that concerns me most about China is that uh, even authoritarian regimes are ultimately respons responsive to some extent to popular sentiment. There's a lot of anti-Americanism, uh, you know, Chinese nationalism there. So I, I guess I kind of agree that it's in that sense concerning because that's the kind of thing that can lead leaders to behave what from the point of view of the state is irrational. But see, I think that in terms of the long-term historical competition that I was talking about in that original end mm -hmm. of history article, it's not, you know, in short-term foreign policy matters, do they challenge you over a bunch of rocks in the Pacific Ocean? The question is one of ideas, you know, because they've got a very different idea that they can base a modern civilization very high levels of material prosperity on a political system that grants its citizens no freedom. That's really the challenge. It's, it's an ideational challenge. So you can see it becoming such an attractive model, not just thriving itself, becoming such an attractive model that various nations emulate it and perhaps it's, even it's ultimately already, the United It's States. already the case, you know. Right. In Africa, Latin America, there are a lot of authoritarian regimes that get a lot of assistance from China, and they say, yeah, this is our model. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be part of the global economy, but we're not going to have a democracy. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, now, a question I promised to get back to is, is Obama a Fukuyamian? I mean, do you <laughs> see it? sounds like maybe he is, in a certain sense. I mean, it sounds like uh, you're professing um, uh, a kind of faith that if you don't screw up egregiously on the terrorism front, that that is not going to impede uh, the, the ordinary course of events. Um. Well, <laughs> you know, I think that if the question is a struggle between ideas, you have to promote your idea. And I really don't think we've done that terribly well uh, in, the last, um, uh, in the last few years. You know, the society has to act with a certain amount of self-confidence and be willing to make investments, you know, that stand behind that. So in that sense, I think they, you know, President Obama himself could have, you know, could have, um, uh, could have been a little bit more, you know, forthcoming in, the, you know, in a lot of dimensions without going to all of the extremes of his, you know, of his predecessor. Uh, but I think, th so this is a, a, another important point where I would differ with a traditional Marxist you know, they really did have this idea that there's this historical mechanism, all of these deep historical forces, and in a certain sense, human agency wasn't important, you know, that, that these, you know, it was classes that, that shaped history. Mm -hmm. And I think classes do shape history, but individual leadership, uh, individual choices that politicians make are incredibly important. Uh, and absent, you know, uh, somebody with a vision to articulate, you know, what the right kind of society is uh, without the ability to mobilize people behind that, uh, you're not going to have a democracy. Uh, so, you, you know, you don't have democracy without Democrats, meaning without people that believe in democracy and want to, you know, struggle for it uh, and so forth. And so I would never take individual agency out of the calculations as to which of these systems is going to prevail in the end. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little about technology, which is something I know you pay close attention to. In fact, where you and I met was, I think, in this series of uh, kind of seminars you held occasionally when you were at, That's right. at the School of Advanced International Studies in D.C. when I lived there. And a, a, I, I, whether it was the official theme or just a recurring theme, but there was a lot of technology right. discussed there. That's where I first heard about Google before anybody had heard about it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, uh, and I think back then, uh, Paul Wolfowitz was dean of, I didn't realize that I was uh, in the midst of a neocon beehive. <laughs> I, I really didn't. The, the, I mean, it's, it's funny, the um, uh, neoconservatism until around 2000 or so, I would say, to me was mainly about domestic policy. You heard a lot about neoconservative domestic policy, much less about foreign policy. Right. Uh, but now I know that the, I was right in the thick of the cabal 
there. But anyway, uh, that's okay because I actually learned a lot about technology and I know you've thought a lot about it. And I want to talk about um, uh, some scenarios you hear. Uh, for example, let's, let's take the ultimate in upbeat, technologically determinist uh, scenarios, the so-called singularity. I'm sure you've heard about this. As I kind of dimly understand it, um, the idea is that First of all, it involves, it, it involves tech, technological change happening faster and faster. And I think it gets to a point where you just can't predict what's on the other side of it. But for some reason, there's faith that it's going to be good. Uh, the, the, uh, Ray Kurzweil is associated with a view that I've probably mischaracterized. But anyway, to the extent that I can, uh, th there's some sort of faith that technology is really leading to some kind of utopia. Have you thought? Yeah, I think it's a stupid idea. I mean, actually. <laughs> So there's actually a Singularity University at the NASA Ames Research Center in Mountain View near where I live uh, in the midst of Silicon Valley, which was inspired by Kurzweil. But I think his specific idea about the singularity is that it's about artificial intelligence. And you know, the view is that when circuit density in, a, a dry, in a, an electronic computer reaches the scale of the circuit density in the human brain, that it will take on the characteristics of a human brain, including emotions, consciousness, uh, and the like. Uh, and you know, he's made various predictions, or people have made various predictions, just given Moore's law, you know, when we're going to get there. We're still a couple of decades uh, you know, away from this. And I just think this is an idiotic idea. <laughs> because, and, and actually, it was your book, Non-Zero, that made the case you know, the best, which is that, you know, it, it, it kind of assumes that all human beings are, are wet computers. You know, they're just a bunch of electrical switches that, you know, take in sensory information and process it uh, and so forth. And that something like consciousness or emotion or the feeling of human subjectivity is just a kind of natural outgrowth of circuit density. And my view is that this is, only, this is a view of, of what it means to be a human being that only like a 21-year-old you know, guy with Asperger's just sits around you know, in front of his computer screen all day and wishes he could upload himself into his own computer. You know, only someone like that could think this, right? That, that it, it kind of is missing this whole Kurzweil other... Kurzweil doesn't fit that description, though, by the way. He's older, he, for one thing. He may, he may not, but I think that you know, it, it, it really uh, it kind of bespeaks a kind of truncated understanding of, you know, what humans are, that it's just the reasoning part uh, uh, that matters. And it's just this huge leap of faith, you know, as you said yourself in Non-Zero, to think that something like consciousness will simply arise as a result of, you know, neural connections. Uh, yeah, the, um, I, there's another issue I have with this view. I know Kurzweil does believe, which, and I think this is true, the technological change happens faster and faster and faster and faster. In fact, I think that's a pattern you can actually uh, document. Uh, there's probably contention over this, but I think it goes back millennia. I think it's always uh, been the case that technological evolution on balance tends to uh, accelerate. And it seems to me that people have a certain amount of trouble adapting to technological change. Um, in fact, that's one thing that's that's uh, happening now with you know, social media and so on. It changes the distribution of power. It changes uh, what kinds of groups organize. Some of them perhaps uh, more passionate about certain political causes than is ideal. And suddenly uh, there, it's a new group and, and nobody knows how to deal with them. Um, so I just don't get the assumption that change accelerating is like going to be anything other than a destabilizing force in the short run, even though I think you know, things can work out in the long run. Yeah, I would not immediately accept the proposition that change is happening so much faster than it did in previous ages. Uh, if you look at the technological changes between the years 1850 and 1900 compared to 1950 and 2000, I actually think that the change was greater in that earlier period because the United States went from being a primarily agrarian society where everybody was living on a family farm to being an urban industrial society in that 50-year period. And I actually don't think anything on a comparable scale brought about by technology has occurred in that 50-year period from the middle of the 20th century to its end. I mean, we can 
you know, we can yeah. argue about. But I don't think it should be tied. I mean, the issue is not that it's tied to the rate of technological change. I mean, ever since the Industrial Revolution, the rate has been very fast, and it's very disruptive. And then the question is, does it pose challenges that will be solved by more technology or not? And there, you know, I think there's some reasons to be worried because uh, if you think about, so one of the bigger long-term historical issues is that uh, human beings lived in a Malthusian world up until the last 200 years, meaning that productivity gains did not keep up with population growth for the most part so that the vast majority of people alive in the world were in danger of starving to death if there's a bad harvest or drought or you know, some external uh, shock. And it's only since this big growth in productivity that begins in the late 1800s in England that we get out of this Malthusian trap and we tend to believe that you know, every year is gonna be, bring you know, growth and, and more prosperity uh, than the year before. And if you look at this in the 50,000 years that human species has been around, you know, the last 200 years where we've avoided this Malthusian state is a pretty small period of time. And it is also, I think, a leap of faith to assume that henceforth, you know, for the rest of time, technology will always produce these kinds of productivity gains and will solve uh, the problems that it itself creates such that, you know, it'll be onwards and upwards. I, I think it's certainly a mistake to assume it'll solve the, the problems it creates, it, you know, soon enough for the problems not to be disruptive. And I don't mean disruptive in the Silicon Valley sense of good disruption. Um, the, uh, you know, on this issue of, uh, it's hard to, you know, to, 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 to quantify the rate of technological change, but I would say that in, say, the last 50 years, which is so what, from, from uh, 75, 65 to, uh, to this year, um, things, you know, I mean, for example, it is, it is really ceased to be the case that physical proximity is a prerequisite for socializing. As a result of that, you've gotten um, a bunch of groups that previously wouldn't have been organized and in touch that are in touch. One of these is a kind of a global, quote, jihad. Um, and in a certain sense, the, the, um, you know, the, the kind of Donald Trump fans, uh, you know, the, the kind of the ones who are in effect uh, playing a, a non-zero sum game with global jihad in the sense that, you know, the more, uh, the more scared they get, you know, these two groups strengthen each other basically, you know, as you can see. And, and these Donald Trump fans, and for that matter, uh, groups on the left, you know, any ideological group now, uh, is, as has been said by a lot of people, is much better able to insulate itself from uh, alternative information and so on, builds its, its own little cocoon. So, I mean, these are, uh, these seem to me like big changes. The other thing I'd say is, well, I'll just leave it there. I mean, I mean th this seems to me like a fundamental change in social organization, and it's far from the only thing that's happened um, right. lately. Yeah, I would say, though, that those are not the biggest challenges and not going to be the yeah. biggest disruptions. I mean, I think income inequality that everybody is now talking about is completely driven by technological advance, that smart machines can substitute for all sorts of forms of human labor in ways that they couldn't before. That's why you know, it's, it's really hard to get a job these days. Uh, and similarly, we got these things over the horizon like life extension, which I think are gonna be a disaster for a whole variety of reasons that you know, politically we have no way of dealing with. So. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and how big a threat uh, is that to liberal democracy in, in, in technologically driven income inequality? Well, it's a, big, it's a big threat. I mean, I think Aristotle actually made the observation that democracies work better when there's not a lot of very rich people and a lot of very poor people. And if you don't believe that, just look at Latin America where there's always been a much greater, you know, gap between rich and poor, and you've got this populist, you know, com alternation between authoritarian government and populist, you know, uh, anti-elite governments that uh, have characterized that region. And I think, you know, you could see the United States falling into some version of that uh, if this goes, you know, continues. And in fact, one of the strange things, especially since the financial crisis, is why isn't there more populism in the United States given, you know, these underlying economic, uh, that's, that may be a separate 
you know, a separate question, but yes, it is definitely, it is definitely a threat. And, and by the way, it's one where the solution is not at all obvious. Uh, 50 years ago, uh, you would have had a lot of people on the left that would have said the solution is social democracy. Just redistribute all the money from the rich people to the poor people and, you know, and we do that. We do a lot of redistribution and it's necessary and, and so forth, but it does seem to me that the magnitude of the problem has grown, you know, to the point that uh, it's going to be very, very hard, you know, to, you know, uh, to keep that system going uh, and to maintain the kind of, pros you know, innovation, uh, you know, prosperity that fuels the whole system. Mm -hmm. Now, let's add a dimension to the uh, inequality problem. Um, you know, already uh, health care, at least in the absence of, uh, of universal health coverage, is unequally distributed. And, you know, we seem to be on the verge of a number of like very expensive kind of biomedical or biotechnical interventions um, in the realm of what is sometimes called transhumanism, where you really start, you know, changing what it means to be a human and people get uh, augmentations and they get smarter or they get more athletic. Well, Clearly, th those are going to be expensive at first. It's going to be impractical for, for them to be covered by universal health coverage. At least it's going to be a real challenge. Now, you wrote a book called Our Post-Human Future, and what I remember from it is that, um, leave aside this distribution question, you just were kind of grossed out by the whole thing. I mean, you, 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 you on almost philosophical grounds, uh, have grave reservations about getting in the business of, uh, of this kind of augmentation. So yeah. I, I kind of have two questions. I mean, one is elaborate a little on that, your reservations about the whole business, but, but there's separately, it seems to me, the problem uh, of, an, of a form of inequality that, that is more grotesque almost than just regular uh, economic inequality. Well, I think both of those are real issues. I mean, the, the problem I have with something like genetic engineering is that I just do not believe that we will know what we're doing when we get into this, you know, that we will decide that human beings, you know, have these bad qualities and these good qualities and we want to get fewer of the bad qualities and, and more of the good ones and we simply do not understand in evolutionary terms why they're there. Something like aggression, for example. Uh, you know, I would suspect as an evolutionary psychologist you understand that there's actually good reasons why aggression exists in human beings and that a lot of, you know, things that human societies have done have, would not be possible without, you know, that particular, whatever genes control that particular uh, feature. And, you know, if you decide, okay, we're just going to edit them out, uh, you know, the, the consequences are really going to be hard to predict for, uh, you know, what the shape of human societies is going to be like. And so I just think that the enhancement uses of this technology, you know, the therapeutic stuff I think is fine, but the enhancement uses of this gets us into very questionable, uh, you know, moral ground because we're basically altering, uh, you know, what it means to be a human being, and that is the basis ultimately of our whole sense of rights and, you know, the political system kind of depends, you know, the Declaration of Independence says, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal uh, based on, you know, the equality of their natures. And once you start monkeying with that, uh, a lot of that, you know, I think goes out the window. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, on the issue of aggression, as long as you brought it up, I guess I'd say uh, there are good evolutionary reasons by evolution's lights why there's aggression, which is to say it was good at getting genes into the next generation. That doesn't mean it was ever particularly conducive to social stability necessarily, and of course certain things like rage as manifest in road rage become counterproductive in a way that they weren't originally. So I, I, I'm not in that sense, uh, for those reasons, uh, you know, opposed to uh, us trying to change ourselves, and we all try to change ourselves even without this technology, of course, along some of these very dimensions. Um, but it does, just to get back to the original problem, doesn't it seem like the nightmare I'm describing is almost impossible to stop. I mean, in other words, uh, you, you know, originally eugenics uh, 100 years ago was something that could only happen in a centralized way because it involved, you know, coercively 
preventing uh, reproduction, basically, and that's something that you can only do if you're a powerful state or something. Now it just seems like it's the opposite. Uh, unless you can find a way to stop affluent parents from doing it, um, it is going to happen in a decentralized way. It's like a homemade eugenics. Um, and, and the only way to stop it is, is, is with a, you know, from a centralized standpoint, and I'm not sure I, I imagine the, the political will being there or the political logic being there. No, I think that's wrong. I disagree. I think you can regulate this stuff, uh, and we regulate all sorts of things. I mean, today we regulate biomedicine like crazy. I mean, you do not permit experimentation on human subjects. Every university's got an IRB, you know, that permits certain kinds of experiments and not others. And, I mean, I think people understand, misunderstand the important, I mean, the way that this kind of regulation works. If your goal, is, you know, for example, it is legal in this country to try to reproductively clone a human being, I think it should be made illegal. Uh, and I think we could pass a ban like this and we could enforce it. Uh, will there be an individual doctor that may try to skirt the law and do an experiment? Yeah, maybe. but. You know, it doesn't matter if it's just a matter of, you know, a couple of weird individuals, but overall you could maintain, you know, that kind of ban, I think, you know, pretty easily. There'd be a pretty easy uh, moral consensus, uh, uh, you know, around that. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I just think people somehow have this idea that you cannot stop science regardless of what. We, re you know, we stop science all the time, all of our environmental rules are designed to stop science in a certain sense from doing damage you know, to our planet. Is it going to be ultimately successful? That's another question, but you know, is it worth trying? Of course it is. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, I'm in favor of trying. Uh, quick question about one of my hobby horses, global governance. Um, the, uh, I mean, we mentioned non-zero, and we both face the problem of, of people saying, you got it wrong, the world is worse than you said. Um, one of my answers is, is, is that I said that, that to make the transition from, uh, to, to a, a cohesive global society, we needed more in the way of global governance. And you've mentioned rivalry with China, one area which, you know, I think we're, 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 we're trouble could conceivably be subdued if there were clearer rules of the road. <clears throat> uh, in kind of a respected version of global governance about, you know, boundaries and islands and so on. Um, but in general, do you agree that global governance is, is something that needs to grow and has it grown enough or, or, or do you think it doesn't especially? The answer is yes, it needs to grow and no, it has not grown enough. <laughs> Are there particular examples? Well, I mean, just name a field where you need it, you know, financial regulation, counterterrorism, you know, dealing with drugs, you know, internationally, uh, uh, you know, global warming. I mean, the list goes on and on. I mean, every single one of those requires, uh, you know, a high degree of international cooperation, coordination, and in every single one of those, the existing institutions are not sufficient. So, yes, uh, that's a big problem. Okay. And speaking of global warming, we haven't brought it up. A lot of people, if you ask them about the future, that would be number one on their list of problems. And I guess one reason I haven't brought it up is because, for that reason, we don't really have to. It's, it's kind of getting discussed, certainly, in progressive circles. But I'm, I'm, curi I'm just curious uh, how grave you think the threat is, if at all. I think it's potentially an extremely grave threat, but it's, you know, it's one of the hardest ones to deal with if you just look at it in, in terms of incentives, because, uh, you know, you're being asked to make sacrifices that are costly in the short run to benefit either future generations that don't vote or people in other countries that don't vote for you. And it's as simple as that. I mean, so no politician has really got a strong incentive to actually, you know, act on it. Uh, so it's not surprising that we haven't done very much in this, uh, you know, in this area. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is one where I think it, it basically is going to be a question of technology because I don't think that you're going to have the international coordination that's actually going to put real constraints on, you know, fossil fuel use. I think that it's going to have to come through just the development of technological alternatives. It'll get cheap enough that, you know, you can do it without, you know, without the economic uh, pain. Hmm. So you have a, a kind of faith in technology then. Um, and 
It's partly because just the collective action problem is so. Yeah. You, you, you think even you think whether or not technology will provide the fix, it almost has to because the collection, the collective action problem is so complicated. I suspect so. Although if global governance were more fully evolved, it might seem less so. Um, let me, um, as long as we're on my hobby horses, let's uh, move from global governance to um, something I like to call moral imagination. It's um, by which I mean just the ability to put yourself in the shoes of people in very different circumstances from yourself. I don't mean so much kind of emotional empathy, you know, feeling their pain, just the ability to understand what things look like from their point of view. And I think at a couple of levels we haven't shown um, a tremendous ability to do this. Um, one is, you know, to get back to the terrorism issue, just kind of, uh, you know, understand, being able to say, well, wait, if I were a Muslim, you know, what kind of thing would incline me toward jihadism and so on? I, I, I don't think we're especially good at that. But another is in the, um, the old-fashioned kind of realpolitik sense of just being able to put yourself in Putin's shoes, say. Um, and I don't think we've done a great job of that. I mean, it, 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 and I'm wondering, first of all, whether you agree. Well, I remember you had, um, you had an argument with Bob Kagan um, saying that the intervention in Kosovo, I think, from Russia's point of view, might give it license yeah. to do something in Georgia, which it actually did. Uh, Bob did not agree. Uh, and, and this is, well, it's a two-part question. So let me hear your, do you think we're not nearly as good at this as we could be? Well, I think you're talking about two different phenomena. One is, you know, do we generate sympathy for people in different difficult circumstances? Yeah, that's not you know, so it, much, what, emotional, I'm talking more no, about no, cognitive No, no, but that's important. I mean, emotional. it's important in something like the Syrian, you know, migrant crisis that I actually think that the ability of people to sympathize with people that they would have had zero to do with in a previous age is just incomparably greater, you know, because you can send a television camera into the refugee camp, you know, you can, and, and it, it plays out in a lot of different ways. So every time we have one of these shooting incidents, you know, you have a week of coverage of, you know, how did the family react, you know, when their daughter was killed by the, you know, the yeah. bullet and so forth, and it generates a huge, you know, emotional response, but it's now doing it across borders. And so I think actually the ability, you know, I mean, I kind of live in a world where half my students actually want to go, you know, to sub-Saharan Africa and work in a poor country in order to, you know, help people that they have no social connection with whatsoever. The only reason they know about it is because of our ability to morally imagine the situation of, you know, somebody in mm -hmm. that situation. Now, what you're talking about is something different, which is a more elite phenomenon, which is, do our policymakers have the adequate kind of historical, cultural background to really appreciate what's motivating their rivals in the international uh, stage? And, you know, there I would say, yeah, maybe we've got some problems. I mean, I personally actually think I can put myself in Putin's shoes quite well, and I still don't think he's right, but... Um, Right, he's uh, not right, but even if you don't think that, sometimes if you know what they're thinking, you can avert, like, like I personally think the Ukraine thing might have been averted if, if people had understood what all of that represented to him, um, you know, before all the fighting started, without any of the bad stuff happening. But um, the, the second part of the question was going to be, is it my imagination, I and mean, you're peculiarly well-suited to answer this one, is it my imagination, or are neoconservatives bad at this? <laughs> um, I, I mean, really, and do they almost not I don't think it's neoconservative. I think Americans are just bad at, at this. I mean, Americans don't learn foreign languages. Uh, they tend, you know, compared to people that live in small countries where people don't speak your language and where you have to travel to get jobs and this sort of thing, you know, we're not that cosmopolitan, and we don't see things, you know, we tend not to see things from other people's a vantage point, and we've got this, you know, tradition of kind of understanding our own institutions as, you know, in some sense exemplary, uh, and therefore, you know, we don't even, I mean, it's interesting, um, we've got a project at my center at Stanford on American politics and comparative perspective, but even if you look at academic political scientists in the United States, the ones that study American politics don't study anything other than American politics, you know, they don't study it in the context of, you know, what are the institutions like in Germany or Japan or, you know, 
other developed uh, democracies. And so in that respect, I think the, the sort of the provincialism or the self-regarding nature of our, a lot of our discourse is, is, mm -hmm. is it's not just neoconservatives. I think it's a lot of people. Yeah, I agree. It is a lot of people. Most annoyingly neoconservatives. <laughs> well. um, so we should probably open up to, 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 to Q&A. Uh, I want to I close with one more question, as long as we're on the subject of neoconservatives. Um, you have really got that on the brain, Bob. I mean, oh, yeah, oh, totally, yeah. I could go <laughs> on and on. If anyone's curious in the question and answer session and would like a 30-minute uh, sermon on neoconservatives, I'm available. Um, the, uh, but, but I'm wondering um, about your break with the neoconservatives. Is there a particular thing you've, you've really rethought that, that, uh, about your prior beliefs? Or did you just slowly come to believe that their agenda was not productive? Did you learn more about them that led you to break from them? Or did you revisit beliefs or what? No, well, so it was a little bit of both. But I think that you know, they also moved away from what they believed. So the first generation of neoconservatives around Irving Kristol and Daniel Bell and you know, the founders of the, uh, the, the Public Interest magazine uh, were all focused on domestic politics, but about the, the uh, unanticipated consequences of overly ambitious social engineering. Uh, and they you know, worried about you know, welfare dependency and crime and a lot of other issues, which I thought was actually quite sensible. And I think that the next generation of neoconservatives, meaning people like Bob Kagan and you know, Bill Kristol and so forth, just threw all that out the window, you know, that um, they developed this idea that American power could reshape the politics of this culturally, historically, you know, geographically extremely distant and unfamiliar uh, part of the world called the Middle East, uh, and stuff that they would never dare to do in American politics, they're perfectly willing to do in the Middle East. And I just thought this was, you know, this was kind of nuts. Um, uh, but you know, a lot of it also, I guess, just has to do with my own connection with the developing world and just understanding how difficult it is for outsiders to understand what's going on and to really shape events and so forth. And so it was a kind of hubris you know, to believe that you could you know, be the master of that situation. Um, OK. So now let's do go to questions and, and answers. Um, I, I want to say that in one of the blurbs about this, there was an allusion to talking about the question of whether history might, in some sense, um, uh, be a manifestation of, of, of a larger purpose unfolding or something. I didn't actually get to that. Uh, I'm happy to talk about it if somebody's, uh, I have my own ideas about that, if somebody's interested, so feel free to bring it up. I think the short answer from you is you do not have a teleological view of history, which is interesting in itself because often directional views have been teleological or they've, they've imputed a purpose to history. Is that, am I, do I have you right there? Uh, I would say that I am agnostic on that question. <laughs> Uh, Tocqueville actually, uh, when he taught at the, in the preface to his book Democracy in America, noted the spread of equality uh, over the previous 800 years, and he said it's providential, meaning that you know it's basically God that is driving this process. And I'm open to the possibility that God is driving it. I mean, I have no proof that He's not driving it. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I think it's also, I mean, as long as we brought it up. Uh, it's also possible that, and maybe this is what you're saying. I mean, my own view of, of history, the one I, I traced in non-zero, was totally mechanistic. I mean, I, I didn't see any like spooky forces intervening and driving it, but it, it still seemed to me that the direction, the unfolding of the kind of you know algorithm of physical causation or whatever, was suggestive that maybe the whole system had a purpose. So this yeah. would, I mean, as long as we're here at a theological seminary, this would be. Uh, more consistent with a kind of a deistic scenario than a, um, than a, than a theistic uh, scenario. But I do think you can, if you, especially if you step back and look at the very beginning of life and trace the, trace the whole thing and, and see how organization has gone to higher and higher levels, cell, multicellular life, societies, uh, you, you get information processing systems moving to new discrete levels, you know, gene, genome, and then brain, and now we're building like a global brain, you know, and this is the culmination of human society having passed through all these higher and higher levels of organization. Um, and in my own view, um, 
whether we make close the deal in terms of establishing a, a cohesive global society, that actually, depending on further moral progress, including moral imagination, various other things, you know, I think you could, you could make the case without suggesting that there's, again, some kind of spooky forces. You could, you could view it as in, in materialist terms, but I guess Marx had a materialist yet teleological view, so right. it's been done before. Um, so now you don't have to ask about it. Uh, why don't we start with you in, in the red scarf? And uh, do we have, we, I think we have microphones. Thank you very much. And I'm glad that that last question came up because I was hoping we talk more about it. And also um, what your view is of the role of stark religious differences um, is in your whole discussion of, of where history is headed. Well, uh, on the question of stark, so in my view, religion actually is an integrative, you know, has historically been an integrative force. It's a way of getting people to cooperate way beyond the family and lineages and, you know, the sorts of things that brought people together at um, earlier stages in history. Uh, but then, you know, we now have this problem that you've got multiple religions coexisting and, you know, highly pluralistic societies where people don't agree on religious uh, first principles. And the question is, how do you, how do you mitigate you know, those kinds of conflicts? Uh, I would say uh, that what happened in the West was you went after the Reformation, after the Protestant Reformation, you had about 150 years of pretty unremitting warfare in Europe over sectarian kinds of issues. And the reason that modern liberalism evolved in Europe was not that it was somehow natural you know, it didn't come out of Christian doctrine or out of deep, you know, relig uh, cultural traditions in Europe. It came out of the fact that people were sick of fighting and killing each other over final ends. And so what liberalism does is basically say, okay, politically, we're not going to discuss final ends. You can think about that in the privacy of your own homes. Politically, we are going to be neutral with regard to religion and, you know, and, and so forth. And so I think right now what's gone on going on in the Middle East is you're having a Muslim version of that. You're having really for the first time since the seventh century a real civil war you know, going on between different sects of, of Muslims. And they're killing each other. And uh, you know, in my view, the question then is, will there come a point, hopefully not taking 150 years as it did in Europe, uh, but a shorter period of time in which people will say, hey, you know, I've got this brilliant idea. What about religious tolerance, you know, as an alternative to, uh, you know, this kind of strict application of Sharia law and killing of unbelievers uh, and so forth? Uh, and uh, unfortunately, that means that that region is just going to have to go through a fair amount of violence before you get to that point. Uh, I certainly don't think that outsiders, you know, outsiders can provide a kind of model. And in fact, the West has been holding up this ideal of liberal tolerance. Uh, and it's been rejected, you know, in the short run by a lot of the players in that, you know, in that region. So I just think that this is a process that's got to work itself out, you know, in, in that part of the world. Um. Well, I mean, I guess the only thing um, I'd add is that I think it's interesting that, um, you know, the wars of religion in Europe uh, followed the introduction of a disruptive information technology, the printing press, which had the effect of, um, decentralizing in some ways power. It, posed, uh, it, it undermined the power of, for example, the Catholic Church um, and just, just began a, a kind of a, a redistribution of power that's in many ways analogous, I think, to what the internet has done. And I just think uh, when technologies do that, um, uh, you know, it's, it gets back to what I was saying about it taking a while for society to catch up with technological disruption. Um, and, and I think there's various things uh, going on as a result of the internet, not all of which are, are good. I guess that's all I'd add. Um, maybe over here? Um, so you spoke about, um, in the beginning, China being um, perhaps our greatest adversary in the future. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, is it inconceivable to think that 
with all of the existing technologies for spreading ideas that they wouldn't um, demand representative government? And if not, is that something in their cultural DNA? I'm sorry, they wouldn't demand they, representative government. Why wouldn't they, oh, yeah. you know, at some point in the future, demand representative government? And if not, is it something in their cultural DNA, or you know, what else do you attribute it to? Well, I don't think there is such a thing as cultural DNA. I mean, there's culture, but it's not fixed, you know, uh, genetically uh, or, or like DNA, because cultures uh, evolve. And so, well, so I think what's happening, what will play out in China is as it gets richer, you'll have a larger middle class. Currently, there's four or 500 million people in China that are really, you know, middle class right now. And in other parts of the world, when you've got a middle class society, people have tended to demand political participation. Uh, and that's the standard, you know, kind of modernization model that a lot of social theorists have pointed to. And the question, you know, for China is, will that play out in China as well? Uh, I've had arguments with Chinese, you know, advocates of the China model on precisely this question. They say, oh no, China's completely different. We're culturally, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're middle class or not. We, you know, we prefer hierarchy, authoritarian government, uh, and so forth. And I, I'm, you know, I, I sort of think that it is true that in the short run, the middle class in China right now are not big supporters of democracy. I think for pretty good historical reasons that they just don't want the, you know, they're, they're doing pretty well right now and they don't want any, they don't want to take any risks with that. Uh, but they certainly want more liberty. I mean, they want more individual freedom. They don't want the government, you know, censoring the internet and doing all the things that they're doing. So I do think that there's really a kind of social basis as they get richer, better educated, better connected for something that will look like the evolution that took place in Europe and, you know, other Western countries down the road. Yeah, and I think the Chinese government clearly is worried about the implications of the new information technology, which is why they're trying so hard to control it. And in fact, there is a certain amount of, uh, at kind of the grassroots level, using things like cell phones to organize protests, of, you know, about corruption and environmental depredations. There's been a kind of, not democracy, but a kind of pluralism um, in, in China because the government does tend to respond to demonstrations, try to head them off, try to suppress them if possible, but also sometimes respond to the grievances. So, I, I mean, I think the story's not over there yet. Uh, maybe one... This person on the front has had his hand up from the beginning. Right here? Yeah, no, yeah. In the second row, or...? Thank you. I wanted to um, bring you all in the direction more of the potential apocalyptic scenarios. So as I was listening to the talk on unfold, which was great, by the way, I was thinking of a number of things. One is kind of perennial human concerns particularly um, empires toppling empires, which has been happening since antiquity. Um, my concern is that America certainly is, to an extent, kind of an imperial kind of entity, economically, culturally, to some extent, even militarily. And although it, it seems kind of impossible for it to topple, we kind of learn from history that that's, that's never quite the case. And with the potential for nuclear warfare, that kind of seems um, a relatively um, fair chance that that may be an apocalypse scenario. Another thing was uh, the, this relationship between, between China and the United States, which seems stable, stable for now for economic reasons, but um, as we both continue to develop, it seems that um, Deng Xiaoping's reforms seem to eventually open China up to this kind of idea of um, democracy of the marketplace, which I think kind of flourish in China is continuing to which I think kind of um, developed in the United States during the Clinton-Greenspan uh, era, where people kind of demand less from the political systems, more from the economy, the ability to choose through consumption. And my concern there is kind of a Marxist concern, is that essentially the accumulation of capital seems to be um, being directed more in the, the hands of the, the most wealthy people in society. To what extent could that potentially cause a financial scenario where globally we're all kind of financially in trouble and it's kind of a sinkhole that seems yeah. entire, um, and, and then of course climate change, which is already addressed, <laughs> but those, those two potential apocalyptic scenarios. So, I mean, I do think that 
there is a problem in the global economy right now that there's too much capital relative to demand. I think that most of the crises that have happened over the last decade uh, have been related to that. Uh, you know, too much capital uh, chasing too little demand. That was ultimately the cause of our financial crisis, you know, the one in Europe and, you know, and, and so forth, which in turn is partly a byproduct of the inequality, you know, that, that the capitalists tend to end up in the hands of, you know, smaller you know, kind of uh, elite. And you would think that at a certain point that's going to be politically, I mean, it's already been financially destabilizing and presumably it's going to be politically destabilizing, although I am kind of struck given this reality that there is such a weak left everywhere, both in the United States and in Europe and, you know, Asia. Um, and why that's the case, you know, is maybe a topic for another one of your sessions. But I think in, in terms of dystopias, there's a completely different one from this empire of capital and power, which is the Somalia, the universalization of Somalia scenario, which is really where the Middle East, the Arab Middle East seems to be going right now, where the problem is really not that there's rich, powerful people that are you know, lording it over everybody else, but that no one can establish any kind of legitimate authority anywhere. Uh, and that you have this kind of leeching out of power. Uh, Moises Naim wrote this book a couple of years ago called The End of Power, in which he noted that hierarchical institutions, Catholic Church, labor unions, political parties, you know, governments, uh, all of them have seen this, you know, this problem with authority, that none of them can exert authority in the way that they need to now, from one perspective, you say that's great because they're all tyrannical to begin with, but truth of the matter is that societies need to make decisions, you know, they need to engage in collective action for a lot of different purposes, and if nobody can agree on doing anything, then, you know, eventually you have this very chaotic situation where everybody can stop things, but nobody can actually, you know, decide to do anything. And that, I think, is also a dystopia which is the opposite one from the centralized tyranny empire dystopia that I think is, you know, these days, I would say in significant part of the world, that's the one that's, that I worry about much more. Like the Middle East today, I, see, I don't see any way that this Humpty Dumpty is going to be put back together in, you know, in, in the next few years. Um, in the baseball cap, is that a village voice baseball cap or just a voice baseball cap? In that case, proceed, yes. Yeah, yeah. There's a uh, person at the University of Pennsylvania named Philip Tetlock, I don't know if you're familiar with him. I he runs know. forecasting tournaments, and he's identified people who he calls super forecasters. And unlike yourself, they tend to be people like computer nerds, not people, they're very analytical, and don't have a religious or political bias, and that's why they're able to do so well. And he's claimed that he's invited people like yourself or Thomas Friedman, he mentions, and everyone refuses to enter his tournaments because they'd be on record on how good they are. Have either of you been invited or would you enter such a tournament? I'm Is available. This... I have not been invited. <laughs> no, right. I mean, Bruce Bueno de Mosquito also uses game theory to kind of make these. Yeah, but I don't regard myself as a futurist. I mean, I, you know. I, I, you know, if Bob asks me what, do you, what I think is going to happen in the Middle East, I'll give you my opinion, but I don't, that's not what I do. I'm, you know, I look at the past uh, because it's very hard to generate, you know, empirical views on what's going to happen in the future. Uh, well, yeah, okay, but that's different, you know. I mean, predicting... What is yeah, your prediction I mean, about Donald Trump? Well, okay, let me back up a little. So, I, you know, I, I really do not <laughs> think that, you know, in, in I, you know, I remember being asked in the early 1990s what would happen to North Korea, and I very confidently said, oh, they're going to be gone in a few years. You know, there's no way this regime is going to... And here we are in 2015, they're still there. So mm -hmm. I really do not, you know, think my forte is, you know, making predictions. Now you can, you know, any kind of intelligent observer of politics will note certain trends and certain regularities and then you apply them and, 
you know, if the prediction is what's going to happen in an election that's going to happen in less than a year, then, you know, you can, you know, you can bound the problem and you're not going to be able to make a prediction, but you can sort of intelligently speculate about things. So I think that sort of thing is, is possible, but I don't regard that as my core business, so that's why I'm not, have no interest in entering, you know, into any, especially uh, competing against a computer. I, I don't want to do that. Um, Okay, so I'm afraid we're running out of time. What I'd like to do is take three questions um, in succession uh, and then give Frank the opportunity to give whatever response uh, he thinks in light of these, uh, he wants to give in light of these three questions. Um, I would ask that they be brief um, and have question marks and stuff. So we'll take one from each, uh, each uh, group um, in the kind of orangish Okay, um, and then in the New York, uh, I thought that was a Mets cap, and I'm, I'm reconsidering, but it's a Yankees cap, but you can, you can we'll go with you anyway. Um, and then um, in the third row, you, yes. So, so if we'll just ask quick questions in, in that order and then give Frank a chance to respond. Yeah, my question is relative to uh, kind of how you see the arc or the trajectory of race relations, particularly in America, with the controversy that's been ensuing over the last year or so. Okay. So race, and then uh... um, my question is about uh, sort of relevant to the venue that we're at, what do you see as the role of social, political, public role of faith um, in future trajectories? And the reason I'm asking this question is because I think, or I detect some common ground between your view of history and sort of meta-narratives of secularization, sort of uh, Norris and Englehart, uh, I have in uh, mind. Mm -hmm. I wonder if uh, you share their view about you know, the role of faith, that it's on its way out in modern post-industrial societies. Okay. So you've talked and written a little bit about elite capture of institutions as a phase of uh, social decline. And in the United States, to an extent, we have seen that with interest groups and so forth. Uh, how do you see, are those institutions salvageable? Or does it necessitate the creation of new institutions? Or yeah. if they are salvageable, how can that be accomplished? OK. OK, so on the question of race, I don't, <laughs> so I just told you that I'm out of the business of making predictions. Uh, I would make the following observation. There have been two fascinating books uh, written in the last three years, one by the uh, very conservative Charles Murray uh, called The um, Coming Apart, The Fate of White America, and the second one uh, just published this past year by Bob Putnam at Harvard called Our Kids, and they present uh, really stunning data which shows that the biggest divide in the United States today is a class divide. It is not a racial or an ethnic or a gender divide. Uh, that the trajectories of people with a college education or better have gone like this since the 1980s, and high school or less have just gone like this. Uh, and that this is true for white people, for black people, for Hispanics, for uh, women, uh, you know, and the basic argument is that actually class has displaced, uh, you know, these other uh, 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 identities as, you know, the most important divide, but it is one that's not recognized in our politics. Uh, and in fact, the politics, uh, especially in the Democratic Party, remains, you know, completely focused on, you know, identity politics, and the class issue is not you know, uh, taken up by anybody really, except maybe a little bit by Bernie Sanders, but even then, you know, he's kind of had to, to... So this is a way of avoiding answering your question. Uh, I actually think that, you know, I don't know, it, it, you know, I can see that uh, as an identity politics issue, given that we have much more information, for example, on police behavior, you know, I mean, I don't think the police are behaving any worse today than they ever were. It's just that people are much more aware of it, and they're going to be more aware of it with better, you know, surveillance and cameras and you know this sort of thing. And so it's going to, it's going to be something that we'll have to work through. But I do think that it's very interesting that, 
you know, all of these different groups uh, around which we organize our lives actually don't correspond to what's the biggest gap in our actual social reality. Uh, question about Inglehart and, you know, uh, values and religion. So in general, the old view of modernization theory that modernization would bring about secularization and the decline of religion is just, it's just wrong. I mean, uh, the only part of the world where that's true is Western Europe. Uh, in Eastern Europe, in Latin America, in India, in the United States, uh, there has been really no decline overall in religious belief or, you know, organized religion as people have gotten richer. Uh, there are shifts in values which Engelhardt talks about. So people have become more liberal in, you know, in many respects, but the actual uh, degree of religious belief uh, has really not um, uh, changed. And then on the question of what to do about elite capture in the United States, I don't know. I, I wish I had an answer to that because normally, see the thing about elite capture is that because elites are capturing the system, it's very hard to displace them. And they will not voluntarily, you know, cede ground. And so efforts at finance, campaign finance reform and, you know, all that stuff gets nowhere. And so generally speaking, what you have to have is an external shock. You know, you have to have a financial crisis, a war, uh, you know, some really big event that, that knocks people off of their comfortable uh, equilibrium. And you would have thought the last financial crisis would have done that. Uh, but it wasn't big enough, you know. Uh, we only had 10, 12 percent unemployment, not the 25 percent in the Great Depression. And so I'm not quite sure, you know, so I do think that you're going to need some kind of a real triggering event that will actually get people uh, serious about, you know, getting at some of the core structural issues that are causing uh, or, or to reverse the elite capture. Uh, but unfortunately, that may be a pretty you know, horrendous thing for people to live through uh, in the short run. Okay, well, well, thank you. I said at the beginning that Frank has grappled with a lot of big ideas, and I think that claim has been borne out. Uh, and he deserves special thanks uh, for taking a red eye out here. He had to work yesterday in California, so he took a, a red eye out last night and seems none the worse for it. Um, and by the way, if you're interested in the latest in sleep-inducing technology, I asked him what he uses to sleep on an airplane, and he said a martini. So there's a tip for you, you travelers. <laughs> so we thank you for that little bit of information and, and all of the other insights, Frank. Thank you. Thank you.